Welcome to Processing Distortion, the new podcast series here at BoilingFrogsPost.com. I'm your host, Peter B. Collins. Today, Russell Tice, one of the very, very first insiders to blow the whistle on illegal operations at the National Security Agency, returns to our program and we want to get Russ's uh, in-depth reaction to President Obama's January 17th speech where he talked about reform. And uh, that was the beginning and the end of it, in my opinion. But, Russ, don't let, me, uh, <laughs> don't let me put words in your mouth before we start anything else. Tell our listeners the way you reacted to President Obama's long-awaited speech on January 17th. The main thing I was looking for was was him uh, basically coming out and telling us that he would dismantle the uh, the mechanisms that were set up with all the nodes in in all the different telecommunications hubs in the United States, and that that would basically be destroyed so that the NSA wouldn't have those connections into all our internal communications. Of course, I did not hear that, and mm-hmm. to be honest, I really didn't think I was going to. Yeah. Um, now, I, I think those of us uh, who, you know, had some desire for true reform knew that it wasn't going to come in this manner. I do think, though, even with our lowered expectations, that the president showed a shocking lack of leadership on these issues because he articulated, you know, some some really nice uh, language consistent with our Fourth Amendment rights that, uh, y- you know, he thinks that it's it's very important to uh, you know to honor the uh, traditions of of privacy in this country but the actions that he announced don't match those sentiments in any way shape or form do they i i, I if anything this is window dressing or or the proverbial um, you know rearranging the, the the chairs on the on the ship on the doomed titanic um yeah, there's, you know, one thing I noticed that uh, he kept saying, and, and I've heard this before, and you've got to be real interested about the, the, the language that is used in this sort of thing, because Alexander and Hayden are, are masters of this. He kept saying this program. Mm. Well, well, if there's anything I know about NSA, they have many different programs. And, it, it, and if one program gets, um, you know, um, leaked or what have you, they'll change the name of the program and they'll make it something else. And then they'll say, well, that program's been discontinued. What they don't tell you is, oh, we just renamed it something else and, and now we're going now and, and we've doubled, we doubled up on that or, you know, doubled down. So, you know, there are many different programs. What was he talking about? It almost sounded like the way he was talking. He was talking about the, our, our, our capabilities overseas and, our, and, and the stuff that we were doing there. Now, now is, he ta- is that a separate program from all those nodes that he has set up in the United States? Um, that was never explained. I'll bet, you, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that it is. Well, there, there was a very clever uh, approach that I would call minimization where the president, uh, you know, talked in lofty terms about the need to protect us and, oh, that our liberties can't be sacrificed at the altar of national security. Uh, he, he used lines like that. He invoked the extremes of the East German Stasi. Uh, uh, but then the steps that he announced are, are so minimal and they're so narrow, narrowly tailored. And, and your point is really important here, Russ, because, uh, I, and I've raised this with your, your former NSA colleagues, uh, uh, Bill Binney and Tom Drake, who I did interviews with uh, in the week before the president's speech. And this, this whole, uh, you know, approach is to just limit it to a discussion of the metadata program and what little the public knows about the 702 uh, collection program. And that's really all the president talked about. He denied that they're listening to our phone calls. Therefore, the, the nodes that you're talking about, first exposed uh, by, by Mark Klein at the Folsom Street AT&T switch in San Francisco, and uh, your former colleague Bill Binney estimates there are 22 to 26 of those intercept nodes at least set up across the country. 
uh, those really haven't been in the public discussion. The media doesn't focus on those. And so there's very little pressure for the president to address the broad scope of Ed Snowden's revelations. And instead, he, he's narrowing the focus to the phone metadata collection program, which Dianne Feinstein wants to fight for, but has already said, eh, you know, if we lose it, we still got plenty of spying going on. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's, you know, the information that they got in relation to what the FISA, record, uh, the FISA court was allowing to happen, uh, the general warrants, that the unconstitutional general warrants that the FISA court was saying, sure, yeah, go ahead, violate your Fourth Amendment, we don't care. We're a secret court. We don't have to answer to anybody. So, you know, but, but what's, what's not being talked about also is the fact that probably under another cover name is, is the fact that NSA is also collecting word for word the content of communications uh, domestically as well, both email and phone. Now, you know, what is the cover name for that? I, I do not know. And to be honest, I don't like to talk about uh, project slash cover names. Mm -hmm. I, knew, I knew the name Stellar Wind for a long time, and I never uttered it until I heard someone else come out with it. Mm -hmm. That way I knew that person was, was a viable person, and that was Tom Tam. Um, so there, there are all these, all these different little programs. And, and imagine, you know, you've got, I don't know, 40 different little, uh, you know, nutshells and you've got you know all these different little color balls underneath them, and they're and you're spinning and they're moving them around like a shell game. But instead of three of them, you got thirty or more of the daggone things rolling around at the same time, playing their little shell game. And it's hard to keep track of them. And, and of course, that's the whole that's all the whole idea. Um, and they can they can mislead you in any direction they can and say, oh, here's here's this, and here's the little yellow ball, which is this program. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, and that's that's the game they're still playing. Well, and even when it comes to the metadata collection, that's the information about our phone records, who called whom, at what number, and how long did they talk, uh, the president is not willing to give, give up the uh, claimed authority to continue that program. He simply wants to find a better public relations uh, method for who stores the information and under what terms can the NSA or other government uh, investigative agencies actually access that data. Now, this is, is all a big game because we know from what Ed Snowden told us that he had the clearance sitting at his desk at Booz Allen Hamilton in Honolulu to look at anybody's records to not only look at the metadata, but to use that as an index to then go call up the recording of the phone call. And so this, this is a, you know, a, a carefully constructed, limited hangout ro road uh, to invoke the terms popularized by Richard Nixon. Russ? Well, that's, that's exactly what the metadata is. The metadata is there for two reasons. The metadata is there to act as the index, because you have to, like when you go to the library, you have to have the index to know what you're looking for. But, but the other reason is w when they use this information to go after someone in a court of law, or in my, in my case, when they threw the grand jury at me, and the same thing with, uh, with Jim Risen, what they do is they, because they have this justification from a FISA court, and or um, national security letters that in, those are the kind of information that they get that they take that and they throw it in your face at the grand jury and say well well you talk to this reporter at this time or you, you know your your phone connected to this reporter or that or this the uh, this news agency at that you know that's the stuff they throw in your face when you go to that grand jury now now what they don't tell the grand jury is they also have word for word what you what you've said but they're not going to bring that up in the court of law because they, because I guess that's a little bit too blatant for even the the jurors on the uh, on the, the, the you know look for the, the ham sandwich to indict the uh, grand jury. Well, Russ, on this very point, uh, Bill Binney said that uh, often the uh, you know NSA's information, the the intel they've collected, is shared with other agencies. Let's use, for example, the FBI. And they, they use it to pop the suspect, and then they kind of reverse engineer other trails of evidence so that they don't have to use the, either the metadata or the intercepted uh, and recorded phone call 
in order to prosecute and hopefully win a conviction of that individual. So it, it's a very interesting uh, feint that is used, where they, they use the illegal route uh, to, say, arrest somebody, and then they're able to reconstruct other paths to conviction that don't use the unconstitutional or illegally obtained evidence. Yeah, I think I've said that in in interviews before. I, mean, I think I've said that to you and Sabelle before. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the same thing. Um, that that they they use the evidence to to throw it at someone, and and then they tell. The, the the FBI and the folks that gather that information that, that we know they've got this now now go find the information follow them around you know follow Elliot Spitzer around and, and catch him you know you know hooking up with one of his hookers mm-hmm. so you know or or you know find General Petraeus you know sneaking into the back door of the hotel with his little biographer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that they're, they're of course, and, and that covers their trail. I, I've noticed a lot of those investigations. When it comes down to where where was the original contact where you found the information, it's just sort of a blank, and no one will answer that information. And and you would think the reporters that are reading this stuff would would go, well, what was the initial, you know, clue that something was going on? But no one in the, in the the fourth estate seems to want to ask those kind of questions. Mm-hmm. And another remarkable aspect here is that the president suggested that he is going to make some modifications. For example, uh, he you know has issued instructions that uh, the national security letters that have been widely abused by the FBI, and that abuse has been documented by the Justice Department's inspector general year after year, that he wants to continue using this whole process, which essentially allows an FBI agent to uh, uh, generate and, and uh, uh, you know, authorize their own warrant to conduct a search with search with the gag order that is imposed on the party that they deliver the NSL to. So the president is limiting the length of the gag order, limiting the retention period. But the onerous abuse of our constitutional rights will continue. And the media serves this up as reform. I can't tell you how many newspapers I saw over the last few days with a, a headline, you know, that says Obama uh, announces reforms to NSA. Well, th- there is no meaningful reform uh, to any of these programs. They have simply, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, put a, a new skin on them, to use a, a you know an internet term. Well, well, you know, I, I, Bill Benny said, you know, I think he said uh, lipstick on the pig, and you know, you get the analogies like that. Um, this, this is all basically trying to. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is all basically just trying to say some nice things so that the American people will say, "Oh, oh you got you're taking care of it now. We can go back to watching our salacious, salacious nonsense on the TV or whatever tabloid trash is the du jour is, uh, you know, keeping them occupied from the boob tube." So, you know, this is their attempt to, um, you know, okay, we've got it covered. Uh, go along your way. Nothing here to see on, you know, and and. And the press, you know, they just, they, you know, the, the fact that these guys have lied through their teeth and they've been caught lying over and over and over again, they, they just sit there and they, they like a dung beetle, they, they just can't wait for the, for the next uh, installment of, 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 their, of their meal from, you know, and then they roll that dung right into their, into their publication. So I, I, I just shake my head and I... I you know what the heck? You know you you were doing what we can, but um, if if they won't do their job, you know that you know what do you do? Russ Tice, the president, flatly stated, uh, which is by the way an authorized talking point from the NSA, that based on the review of his hand-picked panel, that no abuses have occurred under this program. <laughs> now, first of all, let, let's parse that sentence. Uh, have abuses occurred? Just yes or no, Russ? Well, abuses 
changes have occurred. Now, now remember, his, this program, what pro, is he talking about a newly named program? Is he talking about the program Stellar Wind or some other program in the past? You know, we can get back into those semantics again. Mm-hmm. He might be perfectly honest with what he said, because they, they may have changed all the program names on Thursday before the speech on Friday. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he might, might be telling the truth, for all I know. Well, and once again, it's this effort to minimize the problem. And, you know, he reduces Ed Snowden to an inconvenience, uh, to a guy, you know, who should have gone through channels. Uh, and we all know, and, and you're just the most immediate example, that going through channels doesn't work. It ends up putting you, in your case, uh, on the wrong side of a grand jury and uh, a really uh, unfair trial process. Uh, but, you know, what, what unfortunately appears to be the case is the president is very carefully reading the polls. And he knows that most people aren't paying attention on this issue. They have a general disapproval of expansive government spying. But it's not huge. For example, uh, a a recent poll by the Pew Research Center said that only 8% of those surveyed have heard a lot about Obama's plans for reform. Uh, and that uh, while uh, about one in five say that Obama's plans would increase the protection of individual privacy, about one in eight would said it would make fighting terrorism more difficult. Now, neither of those are, are substantial pockets of public opinion. So the president is recognizing that it's easy to distract the American people, that um, they have largely passively accepted the domestic surveillance by their government, and that he can offer, you know, little garnishes here and there, and that passes for substance on the part of people who don't care and aren't paying attention. And, and I think this is the problem, the biggest problem that you and I face as, as people from very different political backgrounds who want to restore constitutional rule in this country, that we have a populace that doesn't care. That, that is largely just laying down in the face of this, this deep affront to their constitutional rights. Well, I think the, the, the populists or, or our citizens have, have sort of woken up a bit, and I, I think that Mr. Stone's information has acted like a, a, a cudgel or a club or a you know, two-by-four, and they've been hit over the head with the two-by-four. And they've been hit a few times now. With, with every new res- revelation that's coming. And I, I really, I kind of applaud the way Mr. Green, um, Greenwald is doing this, and that you know, unlike the WikiLeaks thing where they just dumped it all out there at once, they're, they're doing this thing piecemeal. You know, the, and, and then the government will lie and say, well, well, it only goes up to here, and then they'll drop something else that shows that that's a lie. Um, so well, I, and, I and that, just, just as a, a prime example, on the day the president spoke, the latest revelation is that most of our text messages uh, are interceptable, that millions a day are being collected, and we know that a text message is, is not metadata. It's not just who sent it and how many words are in there. <laughs> a text message is the whole, text message, the yeah. whole thing. It's content. Right. You know, and another thing, remember I said about... Uh, well, you know that, that whenever the government acknowledges that you know that they've said something, you know, and I, I use this analogy that you know they say, oh yeah, we've had a, a few people that have had you know basement, you know, water, their basements got flooded, but in reality, they had a, a 500 foot tsunami that hit, you know, and and they don't want to tell you that. So so anytime the government says we've we've had you know, a couple thousand uh, abuses or whatever, you've got to at least add three zeros to that number to get even close to reality. And sometimes you've got to add like six zeros to that number to get close to reality. So you can never, ever take the government, you know, you know uh, at their word, because they will always uh, lessen, you know, the effect to basically say, oh, yeah, we've had, we've just had a few people, oh, you know, we had a few people that were, they were spying on their boyfriends or girlfriends or husbands or wives. And, and oh, by the way, the only reason they found out that was because these people went and took polygraphs and, and, and they, and they, they, because there's no internal audit capability in these systems, and they spilled it in, in a polygraph because they felt bad, and, and that they, they were they didn't know how to beat a polygraph, which is also easy to do, but they didn't figure out how to beat a polygraph. Mm-hmm. So that's how they know that, that, a, that a handful or so of people 
have spied on their on you know for love interests and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, it's all it's always always much worse than what they tell you. Yeah. And Russ, uh, how did you feel as you watched the scene, uh, the president in the Justice Department's auditorium, and right there in the front row were uh, the people whose credibility has been shattered by the revelations of Ed Snowden, and I'm referring specifically to James Clapper, who we know perjured himself before the United States Senate, and Keith Alexander, who has been routinely exposed as a liar, uh, as he tried to dissemble to defend these programs as the exposures kept coming. And uh, a- as you saw them winning praise from the president, instead of being sacked by him, to at least s- symbolically turn the page and, and start some new chapter uh, in our you know, domestic surveillance uh, uh, history, the president praised them. He he didn't have even implied criticism for the way they've been running their agencies. You know, at least at least Governor uh, Governor Christie had the uh, you know the the forethought to fire people to make it look like he was being proactive about something he supposedly doesn't know about. Um, the, uh, president Obama. You know, we know these people have lied. I mean, uh, Alexander uh, what, had the direct, the direct questions asked to him by by Congressman Hank Johnson. He just he just lied through his teeth, just like just like um, Clapper did. Mm-hmm. So, so he, and, and these guys don't even get fired on the spot when 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 these things come out. It, it tells me. It, 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 to me, that's an indication that that uh, the guys there in the background, uh, you know, have some kind of control over the guy in front of the microphone. That's kind of what you know. The, I would say that's evidence of of a c- c- control mechanism. Well, it, it certainly raises clear questions about that, Russ, because to see the president and and you know he even quoted some of his own comments critical of warrantless wiretapping uh critical of the expansion of of domestic uh, surveillance back when he was a senator and a candidate for president <laughs> and he trots that out with a straight face and then looks uh, you know he was facing them i don't know he was reading the teleprompter so i don't know if he actually looked at clapper or alexander but he certainly could have their mugs were right in the front row facing him and you know it, it's not lost on me that this was a, a kind of exercise in in mob protection that they they circled the wagons to protect their illegal enterprises they all stayed on message with the uh, concocted stories, <laughs> the cover stories of, of what they're doing. You know, when it's the mob, they're collecting garbage, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. here, uh, the, the, you know, the cover enterprises were protecting the American people. And all this was delivered, you know, with the rhetorical skills that Obama clearly has. But when you boil it all down... Uh, it, it was about 45 minutes of a stroke job. Well, you, you know, you can't take that away from the man. Uh, Mr. I mean, President Obama is quite an orator. He, he, has, the, he has that touch. Um, I, he doesn't have the compassion in his speech that, that, um, that President Clinton had, but, but he's, he's got, he is smooth as, as uh, you know, as, as, as slick ice, um, you know, on a twenty-degree day, uh, you know, w- when it's raining and, it, and it's freezing, as soon as it's at slopes, um, this guy is slick, and you know, he says those things. You know, the sacrifice to the altar of national security. I mean, those are those are great quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but the, you you put all that together, and then you see, you know. You know that's like my coming up and saying what a, what great friends we are, and you know we're the best pals on the planet. And I give you a big hug, and you know then I pull out my my dagger and put it right between your shoulder blades. Mm-hmm. <laughs> While you got a big smile on your face, thinking we're the best buddies on the planet. Um, I he just put a dagger in the back of of any American citizen that values their Fourth Amendment rights under the Constitution. And um, I think a lot of American people haven't figured out that they've got a, uh, you know, uh, a dirk, you know, sticking out of their back. Well, and I get offended, uh, and I I made notes as the president spoke, 
<clears throat> he invoked 9-11 at least three different times. And you and your colleagues have been very clear about how cynical it is to claim that uh, 9-11 could have been prevented if they'd had these intrusive domestic surveillance programs, including the metadata collection, in place. And we know that that is not only farcical, but that it obscures the reality that NSA did have the information to stop the plotters of 9-11 and didn't do anything with it, Russ. Well, you know, I, I, that's something that at the time I certainly did not know, but, but we know that from Bill Binney, who, 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 who is the tech guy who builds these systems. Um, and, you know, he said that we certainly knew that the other end of that conversation from Yemen was, was in the States and on the West Coast there in, what, San Diego. Mm-hmm. And, and, and now we know from, from uh, Tom Drake that, that um, after 9-11 that there were inside NSA, there was the big cover-up to make sure that NSA did ha- didn't have any culpability and that the, the fact that NSA had all that information and did nothing with it uh, would not be found out by the, by the commission that was doing the investigation. Well, and the chilling uh, replay of the meeting that Drake talked about, where General Alexander Chortle, or actually, it was I, I have to correct myself, it was Hayden, Hayden. General yeah, Hayden, Hayden at the time, chortled over the opportunity that 9-11 has created for the NSA to, uh, you know, exponentially expand its budget. And at the 50th anniversary event, where Hayden is presented with a big uh, check like uh, Publishers Clearinghouse, like he'd won the sweepstakes. And, and it was used to rub it in to the CIA director that, uh, you know, NSA got its money. And, and so the, you know, the, the whole sentiment that was at play inside the agency is so different from what the president himself tried to portray on Friday. The folks at NSA are our neighbors, they're friends and family. They have kids on Facebook, for God's sake. As if that, as if that means that, you know, they, they're protecting our privacy or that they have any concerns about us. I mean, that, that is just such a, uh, a concocted fantasy. It's, it's hard, to, hard to accurately describe it. Inside NSA right now, there are an awful lot of people that feel ashamed that they, that, that they work there, and and even though even though most all of them are not directly involved in what's going on here about the violations, uh, a lot of them are, are are telling themselves, "Oh my God, I work for this behemoth. I'm a cog in this monster," and and they feel bad. But remember, these people they have they have. Uh, car payments, and they have mortgages, and they have kids in private school, and they the, some of their kids are going to college. They're paying for that. You know all the responsibilities that anyone else has. Um, so, so you know, and their families were asking questions like, "Mommy, Daddy, you, you know, are, are are you are you a criminal, and are you spying on Americans, and you, are you this bad?" And and a few months ago, NSA put out a letter. It was uh, an unclassified letter, uh, two pages. As a matter of fact, I have a copy of that. I can send it to you. The, to uh, to uh, all the family members of NSA employees to basically say, no, your mommy or daddy, uh, or your husband or wife, or your your you know your son or daughter is standing up, and we are fighting the good fight, and we're going after the terrorists, and we're hooray for us, wave the flag, you know, um, you know, start start up the 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 Sousa band. That's the, the the gist of the whole letter. So so any time that they, they they resort to that kind, that's as far as I know, it's never been done before. So so they they feel compelled to try to quell the the, um, the angst and the the shame in their own ranks and in their own families to to send out you know one of these you know these cheerleader letters to their own to their own uh, ranks. Russ, one of the other thing that the president uh, things that the president used as a device in his speech is what I call the Jack Bauer card, and uh, I, I don't generally watch the NFL, but uh, my San Francisco 49ers lost a playoff game over the weekend, and I noticed that there's a commercial for a movie that's uh, debuting in a couple of weeks. That's another one of these uh, terrorism action films that is based on a ticking time bomb. And the president invoked the ticking time bomb w- without using that phrase. Uh, he, he talked about uh, a case where, you know, there isn't time 
to go through these complicated, com- complicated uh, processes of the FISA court and all that in order to uh, break up a plot or uh, to try to figure out if there's a second phase to some event that has already occurred. And, of course, without invoking the fumbling of the Boston Marathon bombing uh, or, or any other recent case, the president just appealed to the vivid imaginations of the American public, which are fueled by the fantasies of, of Hollywood on the big screen and on television, that create this, this phony idea of, of a, you know, a ticking time bomb attack where you, you just got to shred the Constitution because there is no other choice. And these are a series of false choices that are presented in a way to propagandize and manipulate the American people. That, that is my opinion. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, you know, what people don't remember is, you know, we have judges, federal judges, they're on call, just like a fireman is at the fire station. You can call that judge on a moment's notice at 3 o'clock in the morning and, and, and do a teleconference, secure teleconference, and they set up these secure links in, in the judge's home so that you can discuss an issue and get over the wire, you can get a signed warrant. So you know, within minutes. So don't, t- don't tell me. I mean, as Jack Bauer is on his way to thwart the bad guy and say it's a 10-minute drive or helicopter <laughs> ride or jet airplane ride or whatever, you know, I don't know, spaceship ride, mm-hmm. whatever the, you know, the thrilling thing is of the moment, that, that judge is signing the flipping warrant while he's in, in route or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. So don't tell me that, you know, come on. And there's no reason that, 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 uh, to, for the FISA court to say you can have 72 hours to violate someone's Fourth Amendment constitutional rights or three days for that matter, you know, or, or, or I think they expanded it to, what, a week uh, or two weeks or something. You mm-hmm. know, th- that's all baloney. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, I, did, I didn't see the same commercial. I was watching my Broncos beat up on, uh, <laughs> on and the, the I, had, I had to get that in there. By yeah, way, I understand. Because I'm a big Broncos fan. <laughs> but, but anyhow, it's, um, uh, you know, come on. Yeah, it's just more, you know, um, well, I mean, it's exciting to watch those movies. I, I like to watch them, but it's not reality. You're being entertained. It's like, it's just like watching Game of Thrones and seeing the dragons and that sort of stuff. It's entertainment. You know, there aren't any dragons, and, and this nonsense you're watching with this the Jim, Jack Bauer thing is, is also nonsense. Well, and, and it reduces our politics to, and whatever debate or discourse occurs to the level of cartoons. <laughs> I mean, you know, we can't talk about the Constitution or, you know, restoring the rights of Americans to be free from intrusive surveillance uh, because we're distracted by the boogeyman over here that is then magnified uh, by, by Hollywood and by the electronic news media in this country. Yeah, I, I, watched, I, I don't watch a whole lot of you know, TV, to be honest with you. I, I'm, I'm sort of a news junkie and a, and a sports junkie. But, but I was watching one of these, these cop shows, and they, and they were about to violate someone's rights. And, and, and the, one, the one cop, like, you know, bad cop, good cop, looked at the other cop and said, Oh, but what about the constitutional rights that were? And then the then the other the other cops said, "We oh we can use the exigent uh, exigent circumstances rule and the hell with that." You know, we don't mm-hmm. have to, we don't have to violate we don't have to worry about the constitution. Um, so so Hollywood pays attention to you know these things, um, but it's just like oh we have to save the world so the you know the hell with the hell with the rules and. Um, you know, and like you said, you know, did that help uh, with the, the the underwear bomber, or did that help with the shoe bomber? Did that help with with uh, the the uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, or, or or the uh, the one in New York where where the guy the guy that, that was the hero of the day was was an immigrant who was selling hot dogs from one of the hot dog vendors from the little hot dog kiosk on on the corner. Mm-hmm. He's the one that was the hero and said, hey. You, you know, get the police over here. That, there's something weird going on with that car. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, don't tell me that it's got to be, in, you know, come on. That, the, the only, the NSA, what started out, we've got 50-some, and, then you know, that we've thwarted, then it went down to 18 or some. Now we're down to one, and the one is supposedly some chap out in California who sent a few thousand dollars to, to, to somebody in, in Somalia for right. the, the Al-Kabab or something.
something. Yeah, Al Shabab. Uh, Al Shabab. Yeah. yeah, like <laughs> Shish Kebab. Yeah. Go, what the hell? You know, come on. Uh, yeah, we're going to, to to basically shred our constitution and our rule of law for this for these these uh, non-existent uh, you know um, horror threats. Um, and oh, by the way, you know, e- even if they worked. It's still a violation of our Constitution and the rule of law. Amen, you know, Russ. Amen. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, um, the, the people in Germany were thrilled that, 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 that Adolf Hitler, when he became chancellor, was, was stopping the violence in the streets from thugs and that sort of stuff, and that he was getting the trains to run on time, and that he was, you know, that he, he, he was putting pride in, in, the, in the German, you know, um, you know, populace again after they'd been so beaten down by the Treaty of Versailles after World War One, but 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 then look what the monster the monster that they fostered was Adolf Hitler. Mm-hmm. Most German citizens didn't, you know, they didn't realize what Adolf Hitler was, and most American most American citizens today don't understand what a monster it is that NSA is right now, and NSA is is the heartbeat. Uh, of of that totalitarian police state monster that, that is being fostered right now in that in that crib and and and, and being being you know you know breastfed by our our politicians in the White House and everywhere else and, and I think I said in an interview recently I said we have we have to kill this this monster baby in the crib right now because once this monster gets you know you know at to adolescence and, and beyond we, we're all doomed. Mm-hmm. Russ, uh, the president referred to his hand-picked review panel, and I don't have much confidence in a panel that includes uh, Cass Sunstein, (laughs) Uh, but Richard Clark uh, has some credibility, and uh, Morell from the CIA surprised me uh, by uh, saying that we don't need to keep the metadata program. So uh, it's a mixed bag. They had 46 recommendations, and the president didn't uh, uh, specifically embrace uh, more than one of them. He touched on a few of them, but he he didn't, uh, for example, say, uh, I'm going to carefully review every one of these 46 uh, and and look for ways to implement them. Likewise, uh, your former colleagues uh, put together a 21-point agenda, very thoughtful, detailed, had important technical safeguards in it and and review panels uh, of real people, not just friends of the president. And and from all of that activity, the president's panel and the 21 points from NSA whistleblowers, the only real thing that was embraced was the reduction <clears throat> of the circle of of uh, of wiretapping, if you will, from three hops to two, and I think that's a reasonable change. It it was proposed by both the NSA whistleblowers and the handpicked commission. Tell us what uh, what that means in practical terms. Well, three hops. Um, you know, what was that uh, Kevin Bacon thing? Six degrees or some of separation, separation or whatever uh-huh. that were. Yeah. Well, I mean, if if you if I don't know whatever whoever you know, I mean, you know, within six degrees, you 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 have some kind of contact with the Queen of England or something. So, so they're talking about wh- whoever someone a, a suspect talks to, um, and, and that first time, you know, that could be that could be someone who you know who's their contacts or 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 someone that they're they're maybe they're buying chemicals to use to build a bomb. I mean, if if they're truly a bad guy. Or they're setting up uh, reservations for airline tickets to fly to somewhere where they're going to do something salacious, or, or so, I should say, something vicious, horrific. Um, you know. Uh, but then after that, the next is the sorry. So, so I right, say that first call goes to the guy, the, the guy at the at the um, at the pharmacy who who can sell some, you know, I, I don't know, some. Um, uh, a chemical or something like that that they deem useful. The, the, now, now the pharmacist they go after whoever the pharmacist calls. So the the pharmacist family and the pharmacist doctor and the farm. If the pharmacist calls for a pizza, the pizza mm-hmm. delivery guy. Mm-hmm. So that's number two. So now they go to the pizza delivery guy. Every con- now now every every one who's who's buying a pizza from the pizza delivery. Now we're talking about a whole lot of folks. All right, and everybody who's calling into the pharmacist to get their to get their medicines, uh, um, 
is is now on that list mm-hmm. with with you know with that hop level. Yeah. So, and that's that's it too. If you go beyond that, you just get even farther. Mm-hmm. So it's just, you know, we have the mechanism. If you if you if you have um, not reasonable suspicion, if you have probable cause that some that evidence that someone's committing a crime or it's going to going to be messing around with some kind of terrorist activity. You you wake up the the the, the judge at three o'clock in the morning if you have to. You get the warrant. You tap their phones, and if you find out that they're buying. Um, you know, going to some farm supply store to buy a whole bunch of fertilizer, th- then you start looking into that. A- and then you get the next warrant for someone who might, who's buying an inordinate amount of other stuff for, for you know, some fuel oil or some, or, or castor beans or something, to, you know, to be used for, for you know, a, a chemical or biological attack, what, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. That, that's just, you know, the regular gumshoe detective work that, that cops are supposed to be doing. And the FBI, for that matter, that's what they're there for. Um, th- that mechanism works. And having the vigilant, uh, you know, vendor, the hot dog vendor in New York, who says, "Hey, well, something's going on there. Call over your, your local policeman." The guy walking the, you know, the beat, and and then then that's the first responder. He calls up and say, "We got, you know, some suspicious activity." You go over, you look, and lo and behold, look, you got a freaking car that's loaded with explosives. Um, it, it works. Regular detective work and and the, the the mechanisms that have been there forever work. And Russ, you just you just used a phrase that the president used, and it's important to note what it means, and and that is that the president talked about. Uh, he said, I'm announcing a new approach, a transition to end the 215 collection as it currently exists, and to preserve the capability without the government holding the data. Well, he then inserted that the data would only be queried when there is, quote, a reasonable suspicion. And those are loaded words. They're very important words because reasonable suspicion is two or three steps below probable cause. And the term probable cause is what is embedded in our contract with our government, the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And so, to me, this is an intentionally slippery uh, 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 statement by the president, which will mislead most Americans into feel- feeling reassured and perhaps achieve the president's goal of getting more Americans to trust in this government spying program. Well, absolutely. And, you know, it used to be that, that a, a company would only hold on to records long enough. That, and this is the metadata now. You know, com- companies never held on to the content, that they would hold on to the to the metadata long enough to deal with to, to work their books. In other words, uh, you know, did did an ex uh, customer pay their bill and 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 they could contacted another customer and it went from this city to that city at this time frame and the rates for that and and that duration of that call uh, requires us to charge this amount for that person's bill and then they they get all that information and and they tally up the bill your monthly phone bill. And then they send it to you, and if you and if I think they'd like to hold on to a little in case you have a dispute, and you say, "Well, I never called there," and then mm-hmm. they they work out a dispute. But but you don't need any more than two months of holding on to metadata just just for holding anything beyond that. And if, if a phone company has to hold on to that, it costs them money to hold on to it because now they have to database it. Now, of course, what the government did is they came in and they said, "Okay." Uh, with your cooperation, we will be will be you know funneling you millions of dollars under the table, and the phone companies went, oh okay sure <laughs> you know, uh, so, so you know that's what's going on. Uh, we we don't we don't need to have certainly not content. The metadata only has to be there for a couple months, and and when when the need arises, then you have probable cause, and you tell you. You tell the phone company to hold on, to, to wiretap this guy, this guy or gal's information, and 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 look at the last month and a half or so of their metadata, um, and you know, but then but uh, but then they'll say, but we've got to have you know, we so if we can have it back for five or six or ten or fifteen years, we can see a history of well, you know what they're right, you could potentially see a history of a bad guy and what they've done in the last fifteen years. How often does that happen? My argument would be not very much, um, and and weigh that against violating the constitutional rights of, and the Fourth Amendment against every citizen in this country. 
Um, you know, we could also put cameras in every every room in every dwelling in this country. Every 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 even your bedroom has a camera in it, and it's digitally being recorded. And all that digital recording is being is being stored at the big facility there in Bluffdale, Utah. So so you know. Um, and, and and people that say you know that hey if as long as I don't do anything wrong, um, you know I, I'm okay. Well, well, okay. You know, I mean, we have footage of you having uh, sex with your spouse, but that's okay. I mean, that's that's all right. Um, you know, even though the government has that footage, you know that you're you're right. You're doing nothing wrong. And, and oh, by the way, we you know that certainly would be great for for any criminal we suspect to be able to look at the, every room in their dwelling to see what they were doing for the last fifteen twenty years. Wouldn't that be great? Well, yes. <laughs> I, I had to answer your rhetorical question. <laughs> well, Russ, as as we look at what the president did here, this entire exercise. He, he has pretended that there's been a debate about these issues. Now, there have been proposed reforms, but the president hasn't really engaged in any debate about, you know, this reform would be good, this one has unintended consequences, therefore I can't support it. So he has narrowed the discussion uh, sharply into a zone, and uh, I want to get your reaction because I use this uh, idea with uh, Benny and Drake. And by the way, if you want to hear those two one-hour interviews, they're available free at PeterBCollins.com. But I, I use the Brewer Rabbit uh, uh, <laughs> illusion, which is they're saying, don't take this metadata program. No, no, not the meta. No, you can't have it. You can't have it. But if Justin Amash or some other member of Congress succeeds in passing a bill that shuts it down, they're going to be able to say, well, hey, we, we gave metadata a good run. We didn't really need it. it. It didn't bust up any plots. But gosh, you know, we got off unscathed on all of the other things that Ed Snowden has disclosed that are either illegal or unconstitutional or conflict with uh, the representations that have been made to the American people. And that's even if you believe that the NSA would give it up in the first place. Because remember, there's no accountability and there's no verifiability within NSA that if they tell you they're, they're not doing it, that they really are not doing it anymore. So that's, uh, you're, you're using the premise that they're actually, that they're actually um, responding to, to the requirement that they give up the metadata. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. What about all that other stuff that's going on and what about all the other intelligence agencies and in what about the the dia and the nsa and the cia and all the different services intelligence arms and all, and all and there's a whole lot of different elements within the government that that are kind of uh under under the the scope that people don't know about um and remember I, you know i made my my living working the black world stuff working the you know the black operations security stuff. So I know an awful lot of stuff about all that black world stuff that I, to this, you know, I'm not going to talk about. But uh, there's, in other words, there's an awful lot more out there. Mm -hmm. And Lord forbid if that black world stuff is also turned against the American people, because now we're we're not we're no longer talking about just um, uh, basic, uh, you know, uh, you know, surveillance. We're talking about, you know moving into people's lives and, and doing destructive things. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't talk too much about that side of the house, but um, it's, it's just the potential for abuse is outrageous. The, the ability, and, and he says, oh, we're going to have an advocate at the White House and one at the FISA court. Well, so what? You know, some, some executive... Uh, a pointed shill who's going to sit there and shake their head and go, yeah, you know, yes, man, yes, woman. Um, Bill Binney and, and Tom Drake are absolutely, and, and Kurt Weiber, absolutely right. We need someone, the people that are inside NSA that are not, that don't, that don't have their clearance, that, that's, that's uh, secured by NSA security office, and they, they aren't beholding to the management of NSA or, or the entire Department of Defense, for that matter. That, and they and they tend to have a, you know a jaundice eye and an adversarial attitude towards everything that they're being told as far as you know that this is that this is the way things have to happen otherwise the the Jack Bauer you know 
nightmare scenario. You have to have some skeptical people in there that that are truly going to look at this thing and go, really, and that are smart enough technically to know when they're being fed, a, a, you know, a, a whole a cart full of, a, you know, bull hockey. Mm-hmm. Well, as you've heard me say repeatedly, Russ, uh, I believe the only fix for the FISA court is to dismantle it completely. Uh, I, I don't believe that these efforts offered by the president are meaningful. And even, you know, the most uh, adventurous legislation is uh, offered by a Democrat from California, Adam Schiff, in the House. Uh, because he's in the minority in the House, it's questionable whether that bill would ever actually get anywhere. And uh, it, it puts, you know, some modest uh, emergency breaks on the process of the FISA court. But to me, we can't have a secret court, secret evidence, secret rulings. It, it's just anathema to what I consider to be the uh, American way of governance. And uh, so I, I don't think that these are, are uh, meaningful reforms or, as the president lied, uh, concrete, substantial reforms. That's what he said at the outset of his speech, and uh, that's not what we got. Uh, Russ, uh, let me just give you a minute or two here. If there's anything else we haven't covered that you want to add, there is one other thing I want to get you to comment on, but I wanted to close our discussion of the president's speech with uh, any remarks you'd like to make. Well, the, the two big ones that, that, I, that I pinged on were the fact that he said these programs – and like I said, you don't know what the hell these program or this program is, means. You know, is it the program that's been renamed from yesterday? And you know, or we're not doing this in these programs, but we were doing it yesterday in the other program that we called something else. You can't, you cannot trust that language. Those semantics have to be uh, looked at with with, with a with a, a microscope to 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 ferret that nonsense out, that kind of language. And the other thing is verifiability, just like. Just like uh, President Reagan said, you know, it, I, first of all, he would say he said trust but verify, but I don't even trust. <laughs> there's no, there's certainly no trust when these people are blatantly known liars. You you don't trust and you verify, and 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 that that those two things are, are the the two biggies that that I that I, I you know when I was taking notes during the speech, those two I, I had big asterisks by and 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 highlighted as I was listening. Mm-hmm. Russ, I wanted to ask you to comment on some of the controversy that's been generated recently around Glenn Greenwald's work. Uh, And there are some uh, head scratchers, uh, I will acknowledge. And my friend and colleague here at Boiling Frog's Post, uh, Sibel Edmonds, has written some uh, very strong columns uh, critical of Glenn Greenwald. And let me take take these issues one by one and, and get your comments. Uh, One is that Greenwald has acknowledged that not all of Snowden's documents will ever be published. And in an interview with Bill Maher uh, last Friday, uh, he said that uh, that that is the case, that, uh, well, number one, he said that the number of reported documents is, is highly exaggerated. But number two, he said that only a small percentage of them will ever be published. Now, some of this goes along with Snowden's request that they not do a massive dump, like uh, uh, Chelsea Manning's releases through WikiLeaks, because so much important information gets lost in the volume. Uh, what, what is your take on the way that, that Greenwald has uh, uh, exposed this information, and do you have any concerns that we, he will sit on it for one reason or another? Well, yeah, I've thought about this. And, you know, um, I've, I've been in contact with Glenn Greenwald recently about some, some issues that involve what sort of information they had and, and the things that I could contribute as to what what sort of things that they might that they might sort of be looking for, but because they're, they they don't have the technical analytic side that they might overlook and just think it doesn't mean something. That's kind of what I've been trying to to work with with Glenn with to mm-hmm. try to have them understand that something that might look innocuous is actually extremely important. Um, and and I also you know mentioned uh, Mr. Snowden. And and I asked him to thank, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Snowden for for basically, you know, um, taking me out of the, the, you know, having that that crazy stamp that NSA put on my forehead removed, which Mr. Snowden has done. Um, But but you know, I think it's unfair because Glenn Greenwald, even even when everyone else was was basically, oh, we'll go along and and okay, the NSA is saying we're not doing this, and everybody.
everybody prints that and every Glenn Greenwald was the, was almost one of the lone wolves that that stood there and sang out when no one else would listen and everyone said oh that's Glenn Greenwald saying that all oh, the constitution and you know yada 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 so he has a history of 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 basically defending our constitutional rights when when no one else really cared now i see evidence where you see the, the 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 authorities in England are going to the Guardian and they're telling them we, we want your we want your hard drives and the, and then they 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 uh, negotiate so that they can destroy them themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there's evidence that there's been other censorship from the Guardian and we know the censorship that happens with the Washington Post and the New York Times and the and the L.A. Times and and the the publications and the cooperation that goes on between those newspapers and our authorities in this country. So so I could understand where Mr. Greenwald would say, you know what, it's time for me to, to get away from all those constraints, and, and supposedly the operation that he's starting to work with now, he's going to have unfettered ability to write what he wants without it being censored. Now, if that's true, that's great. And and uh, uh, Mr. Amidiar, the, the fellow that owns uh, what eBay and all, who's right. pumping, who's putting up this money, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it 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 could be on his part, him saying, you know what, there's there's money to be made in this alternative, you know, world of non censorship uh, of reporting. That, that's uh, that, you know, and and maybe I can make some money because people will want to buy that uh, that information, uh, and, and I'll make a dime. Remember, he, he, he that's how he makes his money. Yeah, I I know the issue about about the the, the hackers that went after uh, what is it uh, PayPal, PayPal, mm-hmm. and and all that stuff. But um, and the fact that the, because they cut off. The, the 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 funding element to uh, WikiLeaks and all that stuff, um, but you know I don't know to what extent. And remember, the government can put an awful lot of pressure against a company, and and I don't know that Mr. Omidyar was the sole you know uh, spokesman for whether they would capitulate with that or not. Mm-hmm. But I tend to want to give. Mr. Greenwald, the benefit of the doubt, and, and I've seen it, his, the last couple of interviews he's done recently, and he's still out there hard charging for our Constitution and saying the president is is just you know you know doing window dressing with reform, and that he's going to be putting out new articles. So I, I, you know, I tend to think that Mr. Greenwald is still you know, and, and I agree with him doing a piecemeal instead mm-hmm. of the big dump. Because remember, I you know back to the to take that that uh, two by four and bang the American people over the over the head with it periodically when they lose and when they start to wander off to something else. Mm-hmm. So um, I think they're being very smart the way they do that. And there's some information that that, that I have seen come out that I certainly would not have released. Um, my emphasis is to is to focus on crimes that are committed against the American public. You know it. And I said this in an interview recently. I said, you know what? As far as some of the spying that we've done overseas, that that I've done a lot of that spying. I've spied overseas, and I used information. And I, to be honest, I've done a lot more than spying overseas. I've done some, I've done some real naughty things overseas that could have put me in a foreign jail. But, but you know, those people are protected by our constitution. And and the programs that I was involved in, as far as I knew, these were real bad guys and bad entities that we were going after. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just soon not give up methods and sources when you really don't have to. Um, and, and that's sort of my, you know, that's, but, but then if Mr. Snowden is basically saying, look, I've got all this information and I want you to be judicious with it. If that was, if that was Mr. Snowden's intent, then Glenn Greenwald is trying to be judicious with it as best he can in 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 the best way he can. So- well, let me let me offer a couple of comments. First of all, um, I, I share Sibel's concern about Pierre Omidyar as uh, an emerging press baron, but I'm also concerned about Jeff Bezos at the Washington Post. And uh, as the old owners of newspapers die off and as the industry itself is undergoing uh, a a major transition, and we don't know exactly where it will end up, uh, we've got a lot of owners of media outlets who are unsavory. 
And so uh, to uh, put uh, Glenn Greenwald to a higher standard and say that he's only allowed to work for a press baron who meets our standards of savoriness, if you will, uh, I think is, is, is a bit idealistic. Now, as to the staging of the information, it appears that was Ed Snowden's request, and I think from a a media point of view that that's the smart way to use this, is to spread it out over a period of time, like you said, to keep uh, people's attention on it and and not to let it languish. Now, uh, Sibel did raise, I think, a, a very important set of questions about why David Miranda was used as a courier Uh, and was carrying uh, some or all of these files from Berlin to Rio de Janeiro with a stopover at Heathrow. And, you know, when it comes, you know, at that stage, they knew what they were up against. You you can, uh, in my view, uh, explain away some of the early missteps of Ed Snowden in Hong Kong just because he was new at the game. But, But by the time in July when Miranda went from Berlin to Rio and spent nine hours detained at Heathrow, and not only was he carrying this highly sensitive information, but apparently the passwords uh, to some of the drives were on his person. I, I don't know exactly whether they're in a notebook or in his pocket or on a smartphone or whatever. But um, it, it is mind-boggling to uh, imagine how they permitted that vulnerability to occur. And, and so I, I think that, you know, there are important questions that have been raised. I have no problem with the questions being raised. But my issue is that I want to continue to focus on the process that Ed Snowden started, which is exposing illegal and unconstitutional activities by our government. And I don't want to get distracted into a squabble, uh, you know, uh, between whistleblowers, which uh, unfortunately is what it starts to boil down to. Well, you know, I, I know when I first started going into the press, you know, the press, were, they were incredibly naive about security. And, and when, I was, when I was trying to, to negotiate means of communication and things like throwaway cell phones and, 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 pay, and pay phones where I used the, you know, th- the, the, what are the, the little pay cards and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So here I and, and all these means of security, and this was early on, the guys in the press were, remember, they labeled me as crazy. They're looking at me like, well, this guy really is paranoid crazy. But see, I, I knew what was going on in the capability, and the press has to learn the hard way. Jim Risen has learned the hard way. You know, he went to grand jury and mm-hmm. what he's going through. He's learned the hard way. Um, and I think, I, I think that if indeed that they did have all those files and he had some of the the passwords i and, you know i think they're learning it's more of the learning process for for glenn greenwald and company um they're learning in in if that's all true the hard way um that you have to look at every element and if you're by god if you even if you're flying through heathrow just for you know the change of flight that that they can come and nab you uh, every time I go through Heathrow, even though I'm going to, to the, you know to the the mainland or mainland Europe, I, I have to go through security again every time I go. Through, and it just beguiles me every time. I, one time I almost missed the flight. Um, well, uh, I, I I agree. Every time I've been through Heathrow, uh, the potential for proctologic level uh, inspections is very very high. <laughs> yeah. So, I, if it's true. I'd like to believe that they're they're in the learning process, and they they may have been a little bit naive about the lengths that they'll go to 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 nab you. I mean, I mean, they, they I mean, heck, they took the president of a South American company and they downed his plane right. in Austria. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if some other country did that to Air Force One and then said we're going to search Air Force One, you know, uh, and tear the th- plane apart looking yeah. for you know for something? Can you imagine the outrage that that would cause in this country? Oh my God, it would be it would it would uh, people would be screaming to high heaven. So I, I know. And here's well, here's something I, that I can tell you that no one else knows. Um, um, Mr. Greenwald is best to stay down there in South America. Down there, uh, he's he's down there in um, Rio. Rio, yeah, mm-hmm. he better stay. He better not step foot in the, in the United States property, even though he's a U.S. citizen, anytime soon, because NSA 
is working right now with the, uh, the, the Injustice Department to come up with anything they can to slam Greenwald with and company, and, the, the, and Ms. Poitras too, because they have identified them as the focal point, mm-hmm. uh, as the head of, the, of, what, of the, what they consider a snake. And and I, and I certainly hope, and I have, you know, that, that Glenn and Miss Poitras understand that, that that they are in a situation where they are in jeopardy. Their freedom is is in jeopardy if they if they walk on on U.S. soil. Maher asked uh, Greenwald about that, and he said that uh, he's not planning to come back anytime soon. And I think his lawyers are trying to work out some sort of assurance from the government. But it'll probably be as uh, wobbly as what they've told Julian Assange, if if I can guess about that. Well, Russ, I want to thank you for joining us today. I always appreciate your frank commentary on these issues, and uh, I uh, have great respect for you. And thank you for uh, blowing the whistle and paying the prices that you have. Well, thanks for having me on, and uh, I'm enjoying a nice, uh, beautiful, snowy day here on the, the Mid Atlantic. Uh other side of the the country. (laughs) Thank you, Russ. All right, have a good one. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Processing Distortion. I'm Peter B. Collins, and I welcome your comments and feedback. Drop me an email, peter at peterbcollins.com. Or should you disagree with me, you can send it to fullofit at peterbcollins.com. Be sure to drop back daily here at BoilingFrogsPost.com. There's always a lot going on.